Okay, we're now live. And I'm going to admit everybody. Hi everyone. <laughs> Welcome to our first webinar on a planet-wide SOS hackathon. Today we have an exciting uh, topic on the uh, AI in education and we have a Beth Porter that present for us here. What we're going to do, uh, I'm going to introduce Beth right now. So Beth is a co-founder and CEO of Reef Analytics, a scrap AI startup out of MIT uh, that measures controversial dynamics to help people build situational social awareness, especially when they collaborate. Uh, Beth teaches IT strategies to MBA at Boston University. So uh, prepare to be amazed. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, thank you for joining. Uh, and I also have to mention that this is a planet-wide SOS hackathon that you can register for at HTTPS, yeah. soshackathon.com. Uh, and we are um, hacking uh, to heal the world. We have uh, uh, different tracks and different awards. Please check it out at soshackathon.com. And we also stream in live right now to YouTube and other platforms. So um, right, uh, I have all the participants on mute uh, uh, until the end of this presentation. And after that, uh, we will have a community call while I mute everybody and you can ask about the questions and you can also pitch your projects. Thank you very much. And Beth, it's all yours. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot. I'm just going to take a moment to share my screen and then Elena, you can just tell me whether everything's coming through okay and then we'll get started. Um, so I just want to do that and hopefully that will be uh, viewable by everybody. And um, if it isn't, then you can just let me know and we can try something else. Can folks see that presentation now? Yes, yes, we can see that. Uh, oops, sorry, wrong button. Let me just, ah, that's not the one I wanted. Present. Okay. So um, as Elena mentioned, I'm the uh, co-founder and CEO of uh, Riff Analytics, but actually today I'm really going to talk about a topic that's near and dear to my heart, uh, which is uh, how AI is increasingly being used in education and sort of set a little bit of the, the groundwork for how we even think about that problem, why it's important, uh, the ways in which AI can used, be used um, poorly to uh, do the work of education and uh, you know, sort of just give a little bit of my perspective on how uh, this is uh, playing itself out in the marketplace and in schools uh, globally. And, um, and then I will talk a little bit about what we do at Riff Analytics at the end, uh, but I'm going to start off with some basics about AI uh, first. So that's me. Um, I actually started life as a, a high school math teacher, so I come by this uh, job very honestly. I, I taught in schools, I taught uh, colleges and high school, and, um, and uh, did that for a while before I went into software and then learned how to do software on the job. Um, I'm not a trained software developer. Everything I learned came through uh, working collaboratively with other people at my job sites and, um, and really uh, immediately learning and applying what I learned uh, all the time. So I think it, uh, I come from, a, you know, from that spirit. That's my background. And I very much believe in trying something, learning, and then trying again and doing it repeatedly over the course of your life and your career. So um, what we're going to cover today is I don't didn't totally know what the audience of, <laughs> was going to know about, so I thought I might cover just some really quick AI fundamentals. Um, I want to explore sort of the space of the do's and don'ts of AI for education. Some of these are really do's and don'ts of AI generally, um, but there's some extra sensitivities about doing this with um, 
uh, younger populations uh, in public institutions and some other things that um, AI is uh, particularly ill suited for in an education domain. I, I'm going to give a couple of uh, what I consider to be really good examples of how AI is being used in educational settings and then some cautionary tales, one of which is quite topical and just happened recently. And then again, I'm going to cover riff at the end. So some AI fundamentals. Um, some of you may, for this, this may be completely already known, so pardon me if I just go through this somewhat quickly, but, um, you know, we have two sort of general types of AI, so that should say two types of AI. Um, narrow, which is, you know, an automated task that a human could do, but that often the computer can do with more accuracy or more speed or less exhaustingly. So for example, one of the things that's true about fraud detection in a credit card company is that there's an enormous number of records to go through. And even if a human could keep in their brain all of those different records and the patterns that they're seeing, computers are actually quite a bit better at that, storing information, categorizing it, and then uh, looking for anomalies in those patterns and then through that detecting fraud. Um, so there's a set of a whole set of AI that's around solving these very specific task oriented problems that are well defined, that can be routinized and that, um, that can be automated. And then there's this other category, which I think is still something most people will agree where we're not at that level yet, which is general or true AI. And um, there's many tests for when we think we're there. One of them is the, uh, I like best is the coffee test. I think that was Steve Wozniak who came up with that, that said, that says if a robot or any agent can walk into a place they've never been before, um, find all the equipment and ingredients for uh, making a cup or a pot of coffee and then successfully carry out the task of making that uh, pot of coffee, then that's a general um, artificial intelligence, a robot that has completed a um, task with enough complexity and uncertainty and decision making that um, that it really constitutes uh, true uh, use of uh, AI in the most elaborate, um, a pre, uh, most elaborate um, sort of realization of that. So a means to an end for artificial intelligence is a a set of techniques called machine learning. And I thought I would just give, rather than the sort of textbook definitions of what supervised, unsupervised, semi-supervised and reinforcement learning are all about, which are terms you may or may not have heard before, thought it'd be useful just to use an example. This is a picture of an animal. And um, this is a great example of something that may fool you into thinking it's either a cat or a dog. And a human would look at that and say, mm, I think it might be a dog. I'm using some clues or features that make me think dog, although it's fooling me a little bit because the ears and the eyes look more like a cat. And, um, and so a supervised learning technique would say, I know I have a training set of dogs and cats and I've been able to teach a machine how to differentiate between dogs and cats. And now I'm giving it a new picture of an animal and asking it, is this a dog or a cat? Unsupervised uh, learning is more open and it's saying there's a set of dog, cat, animal, other pictures out there in the universe. Um, tell me what you can discern about this group of uh, pictures uh, using this set of characteristics that I'm gonna tell you about or features that I'm gonna tell you about. Look for ears, look for eyes, look for noses. Uh, what kinds of categories of, of animals do you see in this uh, uncategorized set of, of pictures? Um, Semi-supervised is sort of a little bit of both. Uh, you might know the general set of things that you're looking at mammals, or you might have a set of data that's incomplete. Sometimes it's labeled with features and sometimes it's not. And so you may have some hints about what you're seeing, but you might not have all of them. And so you might ask a question like, well, I think it's an animal. I'm pretty sure this is a set of animals, but I don't know which ones they are. And then finally, reinforcement learning is really about 
um, this collaboration either between agents that are both uh, machines doing work or people and, and uh, machines um, assisting one another and saying, uh, you know, I, I think this is a cat. Do you agree? Yes, yes, that's a cat. Oh, uh, I think this is a dog. Yeah, no, that's not a dog, that's a cat. And so it's, a, it's the use of that back and forth, that feedback loop. Um, the most common example of that is, um, it's like a, a system like Waze, where it tells you some information. It's a traffic tra tracking application. It tells you some information, and then you can, can confirm or deny um, what is in the system and help it learn more and uh, perfect the model that it's telling you, which is real-time traffic data. Those are oversimplified ways of talking about machine learning, but I thought just in this example, it was easiest to go with something uh, really basic. So here, just out of, <laughs> you can make your own guesses about what this is, um, but it is in fact a, a puppy or a dog. It's not a cat, even though it has a lot of cat-like attributes or features. Um, deep learning is a whole other category that I think is, is relevant to talk about just for a second. Um, and it's been very, uh, popular and has been uh, revolutionized in, in recent years, um, which is that you don't know, tell you don't tell it anything. You don't tell uh, the computer or the, the the algorithms anything about what it could know about this data set. You're asking it to learn what it can about the data set, and that can mean both uh, figuring out what all the features are of that data set, and then identifying them in the data and then classifying the data and then taking a new thing and predicting how it fits into that data set. So it's a whole other uh, level of complexity around trying to uh, sort and classify um, what it sees. So really in summary, you know, machine learning is a, is a mechanism for uh, looking at data, classifying it, and then using what you know about those classifications and their attributes and, um, and predicting what the next thing in the data set uh, is. And that's really the basis of um, what uh, machine learning and AI are all about. So um, again, I, I don't know how much of what people know about this. I'm going to be overly general. You can ask a lot of questions at the end, but that's a, a little primer on, on AI. So in education, there are sort of um, ways in which AI can be used to really help teachers and learners um, sort of do a better job and do it more either efficiently, um, less time consumingly, uh, to scale themselves. So if it's a teacher to scale themselves and, and, and reach more students, particularly in online learning, that's a really big problem of scale. How do you reach more people and still continue to be very effective? Um, and, and really enhance what people can do on their own. It's not meant to replace things. It's not meant to uh, be deterministic. So a, a real big don't from, and this should be true in a lot of situations, but it's particularly true in education, which is really a personal endeavor, a human endeavor between an instructor and a student or a student and a student and that social context that they build together. So anything that's overly deterministic or classifies students or limits them by overly standardizing um, uh, is really a, a poor use of AI for education. And, and you, typically it's often, often a poor use of AI in general, unless it's an, it, you're mimicking or modeling a totally deterministic system anyway. Then education just isn't that. So really the, the bottom line here is if you're using AI with a human, that is, uh, that's a successful pattern. And if you're trying to use AI to categorically replace a human, that may be an underutilization or a misutilization of AI um, for the scenario. So let me give a couple more, a bit more detail on that. Um, some of the do's, the things that you could do, are to um, nudge new behaviors. And I use the word nudge, it may or may not be familiar to people as a terminology, but really what we're talking about is suggestive things that people could do to, that they can take action on rather than prescriptive things that they absolutely must um, clear the barrier of in order to get to the next stage of their learning or to the next um, uh, sort of bit of the curriculum or something like that. So a nudge encourages, a nudge suggests, a nudge is based in behavioral modeling, but it is not prescriptive in nature. Um, so that's one whole category. I'll show you some examples of nudging. 
The second thing you can do is, is automate things that are tedious. So for example, one of the things that makes a, an application like Khan Academy so popular and so, um, uh, so relevant to people who are trying to learn to topics online is that it just automates, it's automated uh, learning for routine types of activities. So if you're trying to learn how to factor uh, a quadratic equation, a quadratic uh, you know, formula, then you can um, get a hundred of those and you can keep practicing over and over again. And the machine never gets tired of generating new problems for you. It never gets tired of assessing the correctness of those problems. And it's typically best at doing things that require a lot of um, rote or routine or practice-based um, sort of learning like language learning or certain categories, but not all certain categories of mathematics um, mastery and other mastery based topics. Machines are great at that. And uh, AI can then serve to augment um, more uh, sort of routine uh, methodologies by uh, introducing uh, sort of by behavioral um, and uh, psychological uh, elements that help really uh, spur learning in a more um, effective way. The second thing, uh, the third thing that you can uh, get uh, AI to do is to perform gap analysis and do it on a continuous basis so that you're constantly understanding and monitoring the way that a student is mastering content and then uh, feeding new content that hits the places where they have uh, continued, uh, that where they're weak and they need continued work. So that's something that uh, machines are really good at and, and AI in particular machine based um, sort of analysis of the gap between what you can, uh, what you should know and what you do know is, is really a, a great use of AI for, um, for learning. And then finally, which is slightly different than the first, even though they sound kind of the same, pattern matching or the retrieval of content so that once you know what the gap is, if you then can go through a big body of material and bring content in that matches what they need to know uh, or to need to learn and then master, that again is a, that pattern matching, that exhaustive sort of you know, going out through a huge pool of information then bring it back again and using pattern matching for that um, is a great use of um, AI for, for learning. Uh, some of the don'ts, as I already mentioned, prescriptive uh, behavioral uh, change is usually not a good way to go in any setting, but in particularly in education. Um, automation of complex tasks. This is a very gray area. <laughs> so you might think of complex tasks as um, a relative term and it is. So for example, one of the things that's a pretty remarkable technology that's out there and uh, you can decide how you feel about this, but it does work really well in a lot of scenarios. There's an application that's been around for years actually called Turnitin and Turnitin is an anti-plagiarism grading, uh, anti-plagiarism um, document system that takes in a paper that's been written by a student and just sees whether there are um, phrases, sentences, or even whole paragraphs and pages that look like they've been lifted from other sources and not attributed. So that is a great um, and seemingly very complex task for a machine. But in what you're doing all is you're giving um, hints back to the uh, teacher. The teacher has a chance to evaluate those things and decide whether they um, really meet the, uh, the condition that they're looking for, for, for plagiarism. And it's also not done as a way to give a grade or to give, um, uh, you know, sort of an assessment back to the student. It's really a tool for the instructor to um, have a conversation with a student. That's, that's its best use anyway. And so Turnitin, I think, can be misused, but it has been used very successfully with a lot of instructors to um, cut down on, on plagiarism in uh, paper writing. Uh, supervision of students. I'll get into an example of that. You can probably think of lots of reasons why that might be really tricky because you can get it wrong so many more times than you can get it right. Um, I'm thinking, again, uh, anti-cheating software. We'll, we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, anything that allows the AI to be a unbounded or misapplied or just sort of run amok and let it do its own thing without a human intervening, that's bound to uh, get you into trouble no matter what scenario you're in. Um, equally so, AIs that are poorly trained, 
um, you know, that have used a training data set that's overly limited or, um, you know, too narrow, and then you try to apply it to other uh, environments or data sets that um, it's, it's bound to get it wrong. And then finally, anything that, uh, you know, has privacy violating uh, practices, um, that's just, uh, we're going to get into a lot of um, ethics of AI, um, I think, in the next uh, decade of its usage. It's been sort of a rampant, hey, we've got AI, let's just use it everywhere. But I think now we really have to examine um, what the most ethical uses of AI are. And um, certainly in education, it's going to get a lot of scrutiny in terms of privacy. So let's take a look at some examples and some uh, not so good <laughs> examples of things that have happened. These are just a sample. I don't work for any of these companies. I'm not a supervisor or advisor in any of these. These are just a few things that I've noticed have some of the attributes and characteristics of a good AI. So Persistence Plus, some of you may have heard of or not, it's an app on your phone and it's got a really pretty narrow domain of people that it focuses on, which is financially insecure students and getting them to, to stay in college or actually stay on the path to college. So there's a phenomenon in the world called summer melt. And uh, what happens is that a student gets accepted into college in the spring and then something happens over the summer and they fail to enroll in the fall. It's a pretty common, it happens inordinately in situations where students are financially insecure. They can't come up with the money. They don't put in the paperwork in time to get financial aid. They feel a sense of insecurity about spending money on college versus going and getting a job. There's a lot of reasons why students uh, quote unquote melt during the summer. And so this app is used to help students stay connected to the college that they're planning to go to or are already enrolled in to try to uh, limit or even eliminate the number of students who drop out just because they get disconnected from the university or the college that they're going to and, um, and start to feel like maybe they, they shouldn't go back or they shouldn't go at all. Um, it's routine check-ins. The questions are not um, you know, particularly personalized. There's some personalization that's coming now, but a lot of it is really just routine and, and keeping the student tethered to the, um, to the university and, and, and helping them feel like they should continue. This is a great example of supervised learning. It's a trained space um, and, um, and uh, it, it really so does seem to actually work. Inscribe um, app. This is a community driven uh, sort of question and answer tool. Students uh, ask the questions, often students answer the questions, and then sometimes, uh, you know, uh, faculty or uh, instructors answer the questions too. And the, the magic here is that uh, instead of just having the same thing over and over again, questions being asked and answered over and over again, their AI actually analyzes those posts and, and finds the ones that are not only the, the things that people are hitting a lot, and so it elevates those and say, hey, a lot of people are asking these questions. These may be questions you're asking too, but it also automates the categorization of answers. So if you're looking for the answer to a question, you might get suggested something that's already been asked and answered by somebody in the community. And there, they don't know the attributes, right? The questions are unknown. It's just a set of questions out there in the world. And so this is a great example of unsupervised learning. It's just looking for patterns in the space all the time. It's constantly revising its model of the space of data that it has. And it's, um, you know, helps Q&A and, uh, you know, sort of multi-sourcing the answering of questions in a, in a community of learners. Finally, Cogni is a slightly different kind of uh, also conversation AI. But here what they're doing is they actually are answering students' questions about content specifically, and they do some programming of that content out of the gate on the uh, using keyword analysis or so natural language processing. And then as they answer or interact with students and they get more of the words um, in the library, it actually modifies itself by reinforcement. So the chatbot technology interacts with students and it it's teaching the students how to answer those questions correctly, as well as learning how to answer the, uh, give prompts that help students um, more later on. So it's a, an example of reinforcement learning. A couple of terrible examples. I'm just gonna say they're terrible out loud. People can argue with me if they like. Um, you may have noticed in Ireland about a month ago, they uh, chose to do what's known as predicted grades. They said, well, we can't, we can't have exams this year. So instead of having exams, we're just gonna predict what your grade is and we're gonna give you that grade. And everybody, as you can probably imagine, 
was absolutely up in arms and um, felt that this was not only an inappropriate use of, of uh, predictive analytics, but just an unfair and uh, fr fraught with issues and fraught with peril and uh, shouldn't be done. And they're, they're really right. Predicted grades is a concept. It was modeled originally to uh, help identify students who might be failing or on the trajectory of failure and need support. So it was there to try to help with intervention i.e. a human using the data to then intervene and find a way to help support the student. And instead it got uh, misappropriated or misapplied um, to be issued, to, to use as just issuance of grades with no human intervention. And, um, and obviously that, uh, that did not go over well and they actually rescinded that order uh, earlier this week, I think. Another one, and many of you, of you probably have either been subject to this or at least heard about it, is online test moderate, monitoring. Um, Proctorio, they're by no means the first, they're not the last, and they're not the only, but they're one of the tracking software that get used to make sure students aren't cheating on online exams. And um, there's a lot of reasons why this is a bad use of AI, but I'll just highlight a couple of them. Um, and, and what they're doing is they're trying to monitor whether the student is doing um, suspicious behaviors or not. So um, first of all, these are students' machines. They aren't owned by the computer, by the college. They are, um, they're recording private environments. Um, they don't have a chance to opt out. So this is clearly a violation of privacy rights. A lot of people are gonna argue about that legally, but that's my assessment of what we're looking at here because of the uh, inability to opt out of the system. And, um, and so I would just say on its face, it's a privacy violating and unethical use of AI. But there's a second problem here, which I didn't highlight on the slide, which is that um, it's actually also overfitted. And that's a terminology I, I didn't introduce here, but I'll introduce now, which is that it's so narrow in terms of what it's tracking and able to sort of assess as being quote unquote legal behavior versus illegal behavior that um, many people have reported, and this is now seeming to be the biggest problem with it more than anything else is that you can't really even effectively take a test because of the narrowness of what the pattern of good versus bad is in, um, in the set um, that they're looking for, a behavior set that they're looking for. So it's a really just bad on a number of different levels. I'm sure there's a way to get it right, but this is not it. So finally, um, I put through this one, it's not really completely an education <laughs> example, but I think it's relevant, particularly for people who are leaving the educational system or they're taking jobs while they're in a learning institute institutions and, um, and it is gonna affect a lot of people. Um, recruitment, so Amazon, famously, but many, many, many others use AI tools to recruit and retain um, people in their organizations. It uh, really uses a very rigid super, sort of supervised learning um, you know, method to screen candidates based on a bunch of uh, data in their resumes. So if you have certain keywords, phrases, et cetera, on the resume, then those candidates get screened as great and um, you know everybody else gets put into the bin. So, what happened in Amazon was that the training data, i.e. the thing that the uh, algorithm was trained on to learn from, and then you know the features that were uh, used uh, to sort the data um, was written by a bunch of white men who had their own resumes examined and um, found that unsurprisingly, it overwhelmingly favored men. The training data wasn't um, complete enough and um, they threw it out. This is a good example of, of a biased AI. Bias in AI happens a lot as people rush to market to try to get, um, you know, machine learning based, um, you know, products and services out into the marketplace. Um, they take shortcuts on training the data and, um, and often really miss the mark. And there are tons and tons and tons of examples of this out in the world. And uh, people have gotten and dinged on it a lot. Amazon was smart to pull this back. Um, it was pretty. It was pretty high profile. So I'm just going to take two minutes here at the end, and then open it up for questions to talk a little bit about what we do at Riff Analytics. Uh, we are an, an education technology company, and we specifically use um, our platform and uh, a set of basic machine learning uh, principles to help people 
actually use the medium of video to better uh, engage in online meetings. And I say, well, that seems like a very general technology, and it is, but we're interested in education because we think this is a, uh, a developmental environment where people should be not only learning about the topic that they're learning, but also learning the metacognitive skills that help people take what they've learned and apply them effectively in either other learning environments or in, in the job, in their jobs. So this um, real-time feedback is meant to tell people understand the dynamics of their way of engaging with each other. And then we actually model all those dyna dynamics and give them back. And this helps individuals improve their communication skills, both with each person that's in the meeting and then collectively as a group. And um, we track things like, you know, dominance and uh, who you may be influenced by in the group and, uh, you know, interruptions and affirmations have a huge impact on how well uh, people perceive the meeting to be going. If I had a meeting with another person, I'm really affirming them and saying, oh, that's very interesting. Oh, I'm not sure I agree. And giving those little, you know, sort of verbal uh, cues back to people, that can be a very a confidence building and affirming activity for other parties in the meeting and can really help the dynamics. That's just a one example. On the contrary, if I'm um, not today, I'm obviously giving a presentation, but if I'm in a working group uh, or if I'm in a small group working online as a ha in a hackathon team, uh, for example, and uh, one person speaks the entire time and others don't really get a word in edgewise, that really um, limits the ability of the team to successfully create new knowledge together and, and develop something interesting and meaningful in that engagement. The entire point is engagement. The entire point is to use each other, leverage your strengths, and to create um, better things together than you could create alone. That's the spirit of a hackathon. So anyway, um, that's what we do. Um, we have lots of evidence from both research that we did at MIT before we left the um, institute and came out as a startup, but also research we've done independently since then uh, using grant funds uh, to show that people really do collaborate more effectively and perform better on shared tasks using RIF. And, um, and that's uh, what we'll continue to work on as we go ahead and work with more groups and, um, and use their feedback. So reinforcement learning, right, where they tell us, yes, that's, that's what we've observed to happen, your observations using your uh, machine learning models uh, match my observation uh, using my brain. So there's a lot, lot going on there. We'd love for people to give us feedback about RIF. I'll leave this up on the screen for a second. Um, and then maybe, uh, you know, we can talk a little bit at the end if anybody has questions about it. This is a self-service, totally free. Go use it. Use it with small groups. If you want to use it to meet with your teams when you're hacking, that's great. Um, just in general, it's a great uh, tool for uh, meeting with other people and um, learning how to work better together. So I'll stop there for a second. Um, I think, I don't have any idea how much time I took up. I hope that wasn't too much. I'll stop the share now and um, I'll open it up to any questions that people have. All right, guys, um, I'm going to unmute you all. Uh, if you have any questions, please speak up. I I just also will mute you if 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 uh, your your voice interferes with our feed. Okay. All right. So any anybody has any questions? Yes. Yes. Uh, are you going to give us uh, copies of your uh, presentation? Happy to. Is this, um, I'm sorry, I can't see the full name of the person speaking on the thing. So if you could just say who you are so I can know who you are. <laughs> it's Ambassador Overand. I'm uh, from the future. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm happy to give you copies of this presentation, sure. Yeah, okay. so is, is it okay, Beth, if we post it on your page on our website? Yeah, I Is took that... I took every confidential bit of stuff out of here, so it's it's publicly mm -hmm. postable. Yes, awesome, awesome. So we will post it on uh, on the page uh, on um, on our website, and you will be able to find it uh, by clicking through the web uh, pre pre hack webinars, and then on the best picture, and then you're then gonna go and you can download it. All right, thank you. Any other questions? Uh, yeah, can I have, please? 
Um, hello, everybody. Hello, Beth. Thank you very much for the presentation. That was uh, really impressive. My name is Juliana Unisikina. Uh, it's not full name on my uh, screen. So uh, to make it quicker, you mentioned that you got a meeting mediator, uh, which gives real time feedback during uh, meeting, which helps uh, improve communication. Yes, that's very interesting. Uh, and my question is, do you have any um, patterns and um, um, ways uh, how you how you do adjustment to particular cases? Because you know, uh, uh, meetings are very different. Like if it's a mm -hmm. meeting with, a, uh, uh, for example, today the hackathon, or it's an investment meeting. Uh, that's a completely different behavior and uh, uh, rules. Yep. Yep. So how uh, could you explain? Yeah, I totally understand the question. Yeah, thanks for the question. It's a great one. We get it a lot, actually. Um, one of the things that we have as sort of a central premise of the platform is that when you're meeting together online, it's a kind of, you should use the time that you have preciously. If there is a set of, um, if, you're, if you're doing what I'm doing right now, which is broadcasting, I'm broadcasting a presentation, you're asking me some questions, that's a pattern that isn't really a meeting, it's a broadcast, and it has a certain dynamic, which we all kind of understand, right? But we use, instead of using uh, meetings as working groups, because that's really what they should be, people working together to solve common problems, it shouldn't be a broadcast, we, we conflate the two things all the time. So our central premise is that RIF is for working meetings, it's for people get together to do work together and that's where the feedback is um, optimized. That said, we're sensitive to the fact that lots of people are gonna wanna use it for other things. And so there's a set of features coming out in the next you know, quarter or so that will have the feedback loop that says, here's the meeting type, yeah. the pattern I expect, here's the pattern that got observed, here's, uh, how, we felt, here's how we felt about it. Right, so that whole sort of sequence to reinforce what we can observe and then feed it back into the system and refine the models of what meetings look like. We're gonna go in with a set of suppositions about it. So it'll actually be semi-supervised and, um, and then we're gonna refine as we go. So it's, it's an excellent question. It's really at the heart of, you know, kind of what online meetings are all about. What are they all yeah, about? What should uh, they be it, about? Yeah, in that way, it's really uh, AI when, you, if you adjust uh, your curve, exactly. which you showed on the screen with the, uh, graphs and uh, uh, speaking time etc uh, that is yeah. uh, we, we do post meeting surveys now we just don't do the thing on the front end yet so we do okay. ask people you know how did that go do you feel that uh -huh. there's a dominance pattern did you get a chance to speak things like that we ask that at the uh -huh. end now we just don't have the the inputs on the front end so that's the new oh. feature super thank you Next question hi um natalia from mexico I have a question. Do you expect to have cultural nuances or generational um, differences as into the behaviors that are mapped? It's such a good question, Natalia. Yeah, that's a great question. So culture sensitivity, gender sensitivity, age sensitivity, you know, like pick your favorite. Uh, there are definitely change differences between different populations, but what we do, what we don't do is we don't, um, we're not overly judgmental in our feedback. Most of what we give is observational, which means that if, let's say, uh, you have a very verbose or effusive person or people and very, very reserved people in the same meeting, they're going to have some clash of styles, right? Some the overly verbose people may tend to just talk and talk and talk and not let anybody else in. The reserved people who are more deferential or, and don't feel the need to speak, um, they're gonna they're gonna have diminished speaking time. What we've shown is that our feedback on screen changes those behaviors and gives people that are quieter more of an opportunity to speak and helps people who are dominant bring down their speaking so that there's more parity in the, in the meetings. And that's really the goal that we're looking for. The, the game that we're playing is to try to get people to keep the meeting mediator center. We are observing. Yep, go ahead. Sorry. No, we, we are observing changes in the language. Even sometimes when you want to read 
at teenagers uh, mobile or messaging. You don't understand the cues of what they mean just because they've changed the way they communicate and they use slang and the way they use their own uh, social cues. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that, that we um, experience is there is a gap and sometimes a misunderstanding or, or digital disruption when between digital natives and those that are in between. Yeah. And the, um, I wonder how important it would be for AI to be sensitive and mindful of all of this yeah. so that we can understand because these, this is, um, technology has deeply disrupted the, the way people interact. And now with COVID, all, all of the generations are were being disrupted by technology. So I, if, if RIF would only be able for us to be better at bridging these gaps, because it's hard enough. I mean, we see this in organizations or even in families trying to connect between each other. So I, I wonder how AI can help us um, really learn the uh, specifics. And, and, and I don't mean about dominance only, <laughs> of, or, but um, even language or yeah. the ability to connect. Let me pick up on a couple of themes that you have in there. There's two things I think are really relevant about what you're sharing. One is that we, um, and, and by the way, there's lots of different kinds of technologies that try to do some of this stuff. So we hit a pretty narrow band, but it's an important one, which is that we don't do any language processing. So we don't care what words you're using. Everything that we're doing is based on vocal signal alone and how we're able to take the vocal patterns that we see and translate that into a set of low level human person to person behaviors that are pretty universal across the human species. These are really, really low level, almost simian, you know, like sort of behaviors that people um, take on that are still there, right? Like if, if I lean forward like this, you're gonna do it too if we're talking to one another, it's mimicking, it's a very low level pattern. And so we do it in vocal speech too. And it doesn't matter what you're saying. A lot of these patterns are discernible without having that language barrier. Uh, obviously you have to be able to literally communicate with one another using the same language, but, but yes, that stuff can be surfaced very nicely inside of RIF, but it doesn't depend on language. And, it, and, it, and, it, and our observation in the various studies we've done, which have been cross-cultural, uh, gender divided, is that um, it kind of levels everybody out, no matter where you're coming from. Um, age is not something we studied though, so it's a really interesting idea. And I, I'm gonna take that back to the team and see if we can set up a study for that, because it's quite interesting. Ge generational divide is not uh, well known, not studied by us anyway. Thank you for the question, Natalia. Thank you. Uh, is there any more questions? We have time for one more question and then we have to move on. If nobody can ask, then I'll be done. Um, uh, but cool to uh, give some explanation of how feedback um, looks like. Um, um, so from this mediator, uh, how a uh, user uh, monitor it and understand what yeah what's the explanation is it diagrams yeah sure so we have the meeting mediator is actually a super low level visual only it has some hover states so if you hover over it it'll give you some feedback it's mostly for accessibility compliance but there's real information there and the way it works i can send or actually um uh, you can post some papers about this, Elena, afterwards if you want to, because they're public papers. Um, the research um, that we did showed that just having the subtle feedback of the visualization, which changes in real time, it's a five minute moving window of the behavior of the group over time in the meeting. Uh -huh. um, just having that feedback changes the way that people behave in real time. That's great. So it might diminish a voice that's too um, dominant or right, raise a voice that's too, uh, or stop somebody from interrupting a lot, that kind of thing. What's more powerful though, is the overtime 
metrics, which is the pattern that you observe as you meet incrementally with either the same group or a, the same person over time in different groups. That mm -hmm. is where the real power of the feedback comes from. So the real-time intervention is important for you know, like nudging different behaviors right then and there, but yeah. the, the enduring effect is from the overtime metrics and seeing that pattern and then changing um, over time. Yeah, because that metrics should be visualized uh, very easy uh, if it's for students, teenagers, and uh, yes. uh, learners. So be super obvious. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah, totally understand. Which is why we haven't done a lot of textual stuff. Like we don't put any words on the screen. It's all visual because we just, uh -huh. and it's not numerical either. A lot of, you can get numbers, there are numbers under there, but like the visual stuff is really what most people are like, oh, oh, I see, I understand that because it's visual. I mean, that's what we're going for. So I have tons of work still to do, but you know, that's, what, that's the metaphor we're using. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Leanna. Thank you, Beth. Uh, uh, thank you, Beth, so much for presenting to us. Uh, that was so great. And uh, uh, we hope to see you again at our SOS Hackathon. So now we, we have to move on with uh, the uh, presentation of our team's ideas. Um, so if you uh, here to present your idea and here to listen and also ask questions about the hackathon, so please stay on this call. It's also going to be stream streamed live on YouTube. So how is it going to work? If you would like to present your idea, please uh, either raise your hand or unmute your microphone and we'll start presenting. All right, so we, we, we're going to start with Daniel. Hello, can everybody hear me? Yes. Yes, Daniel. Yes. Okay. Um, is it okay if I uh, share my screen and share some slides? Y yes, for sure. Yes, please okay. do. I'm just going to give a uh, general presentation here that I uh, give, but I have one slide that's tailored to the hackathon. Uh, if you'll excuse me, I have multiple tabs open because I'm multiple things that I'm managing. But um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Daniel Little. I am the executive director of an organization called Involvement. Uh, we're based in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, in the United States. Um, and we're working in communities locally here in Pittsburgh, but uh, as we move forward with our model, we're hoping to take our model to other places as well uh, in response to uh, the need of our communities. So what we do is we build local currency systems and under-resourced communities to empower residents to effect positive change. And part of that is creating a new type of, we call it a, a new type of position. It's quite, it's not exactly employment, but it's kind of like employment. Um, and it's not quite volunteer, but we're calling them change makers in the, uh, the general sense. Um, so just to give you some background on the organization, one of the reasons why, why we formed as an organization is response to systemic failings of the United States. Uh, the United States ranks at or near the bottom of every quality of life indicator uh, tracked by among developed countries. So you can pretty much infer from that, that there is a systemic issue and a systemic problem uh, within the United States currently and with everything that's going on with COVID and in the news and that sort of thing and our United States uh, you know, poor response to it, uh, you can infer that even further. Um, in addition to this, many of communities uh, uh, of concentrated poverty are going to be the first to be adversely impact the upcoming shocks that are going to be due to climate change and due to, you know, ecosystem imbalance, which, you know, in a lot of research indicates that might lead to more pandemics. So we need to create some uh, agency and we need to create some community sovereignty so that communities are able to build systems to be able to support themselves, especially during uh, times of crisis. Um, many of you probably know the United States is a very unequal nation. Uh, this is just a map in Pittsburgh uh, here about how poverty, the darker areas is uh, areas of concentrated poverty and how poverty concentrates locally in these areas. And we're working in some of the darker areas, namely uh, Braddock here and in Hazelwood, which is down here. Um, so you might be asking yourself, okay, so there are a lot of different forms of community-based investment that have traditionally um, supported these communities in the time pa in, in the past. Uh, the first is through government, uh, the second through is through corporations, and the third is through private philanthropy. But if we look at those forms of community-based investment, we find that the government, if you look at the first form, the government is becoming, uh, the federal government is becoming increasingly less willing to 
through block grant funding to fund uh, community-based organizations. As you can see, it's been falling since 2000. Uh, if you look at the private sector, you see that Americans are working longer hours for lower wages. There's been a lot of uh, wages have been flatlining since the 1970s and since 2015, they've actually been decreasing uh, in response to uh, if you adjust everything for inflation. And then there's also the risks of automation being uh, putting more workers out of work. Um, and if you look at the private sector, uh, or I'm sorry, the private philanthropic sector, you see that in the United States, States, most of the giving to foundations is among individual giving, but individual giving is also falling. And as we're seeing an increased need, one of the fastest growing sectors in the United States is the social service sector. Um, foundations are not able to keep up with the need, which they serve 15% of um, philanthropic giving. They're not able to keep up with the need. Um, and as the stock market collapses, uh, or as the stock market, they're, they're really subject to the performance of the stock market because many of their investments are based in the stock market. And as the stock market kind of uh, underperforms, that decreases the foundation's ability to be able to give. Um, so it's kind of cyclical with, uh, you would think that foundations would give more during times of crisis, but they're actually less able to give more uh, during times of economic crisis. So we're proposing a fourth uh, new form of community-based investment we're, we're calling digital complementary community currencies. And this is an idea that is, has been uh, voiced for, it's nothing new. Uh, it's a, there's a lot of uh, economic precedent and a lot of economic thinking uh, behind this. Namely, uh, one of the leaders and the proponents of uh, this is uh, Stephanie Kelton, who was a chief advisor to, uh, one of the economic advisors to Bernie Sanders. And there's uh, talks in Illinois about you know, establishing a statewide currency there. And we're developing a platform to be able uh, to host this currency um, that platform is slated to become available in August. So what we want to do is create this concept of the change maker where we're directly facilitating human capital individuals to actually solve community challenges, whether that is uh, helping to alleviate poverty, whether that is helping to install green infrastructure, whether that's helping to uh, build systems to enable uh, community food security. Uh, we want to basically deploy people so that they're earning a living with the, in this alternative currency, so they're directly establishing, uh, directly tack tackling the challenges in the community. So we've created a web app that enables people to find community positions to join in exchange for the work they can re uh, receive local currency that they can spend uh, for neighborhood resources. The core uh, crux of this uh, is the change maker, which is basically individuals in the community that could be you know, just frustrated working in the gig economy and they want to do something a little bit more meaningful and they're willing to give their time uh, to a community cause uh, that is determined by the community to, um, to uh, address a chronic challenge. Uh, the way the currency works, very simply, every hour that you serve in the community, you get one time credit. We're valuing the time credit about $15 an hour. Uh, the change maker will give their time to a serve partner or CBO lead agency, um, and uh, they'll give their time on a recurring basis and um, they will earn uh, credits which they can spend and circulate throughout the community, either through person-to-person -person exchanges or through uh, spend partners that we onboard through local businesses. And you might ask yourself, okay, so how are you bringing value to the currency? Well, there's two parts to how we're bringing value. One is through the resources that we're able to bring to the network. So any basic community entity, basically if it's an individual or a spend partner, which would be a small business uh, or a, a community-based business can sign up to uh, get a wallet and um, the resources that they have to offer in addition to uh, the US dollar, they can accept the currency at, uh, their, um, at, their, at their point of sale. Um, an example of like an underutilized resource, an asset that we're using to activate to bring value to the currency is food waste. One of our projects is called Food Security Refresh where we're working on uh, taking food waste that has traditionally gone into the landfill and um, traditionally uh, releases methane emissions in the landfill. We're using community-based labor to actually turn that food waste into compost, sequestering that com uh, carbon in the process and growing fresh and healthy food in a community that is currently underserved by the market in terms of being, uh, getting access to produce, which is usually done through private grocery stores. Um, so this is kind of our call to action to individuals uh, and change makers in the community. Uh, we work with partner organizations like Deca Resources and Worm Return, which are local uh, community organizations here. Um, and basically, we want people to be able to contribute to the community that they love. 
Um, in addition to this, the other uh, aspect which gives the currency value is the data and the content creation that we're uh, creating from the minting of the credits. So the time credit uh, is enables people to not only facilitate service, but people in order to earn the time credit, they have to generate some sort of content or data around the work that they're doing. So this content and data can be concatenated in uh, sustainable development goals that have been put forth by the UN. These are the four, uh, six sustainable development goals that we're focusing on for our food security refreshed initiative. And basically what happens is we either give the uh, change maker a conversational user interface or before and after photo or a geotag and clock in their location. They uh, collect that data uh, that is then concatenated in SDGs for the food security project is how many pounds of food waste have you uh, collected and uh, turned into compost. And we can uh, use that and uh, kind of surmise the carbon offsets that are created by these change makers um, uh, uh, creating or collecting that compost. Another example is the city of Pittsburgh has a goal to plant 10,000 trees to increase, uh, increase the tree canopy within the city. Uh, our app can tr uh, track directly the impact that is having, that the change makers are having on the ground uh, actually planting the trees. And every time the trees are planted, they, in the, they uh, demonstrate the proof of service that they are creating. The credit gets minted and spent in the economy. And um, basically this has a lot of uh, potential impact uh, for funders and government uh, who want to see what is the impact that their citizens are having uh, in the community. So we're hoping to leverage these SDGs and collect this content data that the change makers are creating on the ground in the community um, and distribute that back to the funders and government so they can assess the impact that they're having uh, in tackling climate change and in solving chronic challenges through community-based labor. Um, so given the hackathon here, there's basically three things uh, we can do one of or multiple of the three things that I'm looking to explore. Uh, but we are currently, our app is basically based in Angular and we have a MySQL database that is hosting the app, but it is a decoupled application. So we're looking about potentially exploring uh, decentralizing some aspects of this, either through a DAO governance system, uh, which one of the biggest challenges that we're, are not a uh, challenge that we're finding, but one of the things that we do is, or that we're still kind of working through is, you know, what projects to get to, uh, who gets to decide which projects you know are able to create currency? Um, so we're looking at possibly a DAO governance system for doing that. Um, the other portion of this that I did not mention in the presentation, but is sort of the change makers through the content and data that they're creating. They're gonna that content and data gets aggregated into a social resume that is on the platform. So each change maker gets that social resume that shows what is the impact of the work that I've done in the community myself. And they, we want them to be able to use that social resume for as essentially a resume that they can use to gain uh, uh, employment, especially people who might be lower income use it to gain employment uh, with other uh, entities. And then also decentralizing the currency itself um, and how that kind of works with the sort of proof of service where uh, the community impact or the minting of the currency is done through the verification of people actually doing work on the ground. Um, so that's kind of uh, our pitch in a nutshell. Um, and you know, we don't have we're, we currently have developers that are working on the platform, but nobody who's working on sort of the the blockchain uh, or investigating mm -hmm. the blockchain side of this. So um, that's kind of what we're looking to explore. Um, does anybody awesome. have any awesome. questions? Yeah, thank you. Th Mm -hmm. Thank you, Daniel. Yes, yeah, so you can find uh, Daniel's uh, in involvement in our yeah. Discord. Please message uh, Daniel in, in the Discord. You can ask questions now. And also, from what I see, we probably need to bring as one of the uh, pre-hack webinars the uh, regulators uh, because there is uh, lots of DAOs um, ideas that we see right now and uh, a common question among them is how it actually fits into the regulatory landscape mm -hmm. uh, to make everything uh, legal, right? So, so yeah. yes, we, we will be bringing somebody to talk about that and to give you help with that. Yes, but this is a great idea. Any questions on the Daniel's idea?
Thank you, Daniel. You can stop sharing your screen. Uh, yes, and again, you can reach out to Daniel in Discord. Uh, to, in order to get to Discord, you can go to our website, soshackathon.com, oh. and you will see a Discord link there. Uh, so in Daniel's team called Involvement. Thank you. Anyone else wants to present? Please raise your hand. I don't see, as of now, I don't see any hands raised. Uh, do you have any questions about the hackathon logistics and uh, anything unclear about the process? We're getting some questions. Yes. One hand raised, um, I, but they were raising it on the screen. Yeah, OK. This is Wally. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. OK. Yes, I, I, I didn't see that. So who, uh, yeah, if you would like to ask a question or speak up, please just maybe unmute your microphone. <laughs> Hi. We do I hear? You. Yeah. Do you hear anybody speaking? Yeah, I heard him say something. Uh, All right. Yeah. I Unfortunately, I cannot see all the participants on the on one screen because we have uh, eleven of them right now. All right, so uh, I assume there is no questions. Okay, um, yeah. So I we, we also we received the the questions from the participants on what of the process of building the teams, and uh, so. This uh, I'm answering your question. So we uh, and what is the source of uh, information. Uh, so we post all the information in Discord. So if you have any question, you can always reach out to us on Discord. Uh, and Discord link is posted on soshackathon.com website. So the process of the, of the registration to the hackathon, you register and you register on a Discord. You create your own team. You ask to create the uh, channel, one of the um, admins. And then you assemble your own team and we start working together. We're going to do uh, calls like this where you can ask questions if anything unclear. We're also going to publish all the submission process and the voting process. So don't worry about that right now. Uh, so right now your task is just to assemble your team, uh, get together in a Discord with your team and start forming your idea for the hackathon that's going to be starting on June 1st. And our opening ceremony is going to be May 29th uh, uh, to May 31st. In this, we will have our keynote speakers that are, will be giving you also ideas on what to hack on. Do you have any questions? Yeah, and I have to say that uh, after the hackathon is ended and all the voting is posted and the winners announced, we also will have a spreadathon event where we invite in uh, uh, filmmakers, we invite in actors and artists to promote the hackathon project. So we have uh, right now we have uh, Ambassador um, Oda who is. Uh, uh, one of the leaders of this uh, event. So he's working on this event right now. So if you have any questions of how your project's going to be promoted, yes, you can also ask that. All right, uh, anyone who wants to present? Well, hello. Yes, yes. Uh, yes, I have a question concerning the assessment. Uh, sorry, say it again, I, uh, I couldn't hear. Well, well uh, like I'm... Okay, you're breaking up a little. Can, can you, you please me? repeat? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Yeah, this is Mohammed, right? Yes, of course. Yes, yes, Mohammed. Yeah, please, please speak. Yeah, because we, we hear you. Yes, please. Please ask your uh, question. Yes, well, I have a question about the assessment of application. Well, in the hackathon uh, page, you said that we have voting power and uh, yes, and based on this power, like our applications will be as, uh, assessed, but uh, like uh, will be like judge, judges who will judge our applications and will will we have uh, 
uh, an application form or for uh, to apply to the hackathon? Uh, yes, so you mean to uh, apply as a voter, right? So to sign up as a voter? Yeah. Like Yes, yes, we uh, we already we developed the process, but this process unfortunately was like too complicated. So right now we're changing our code to make this process very easy for you. So when you sign up as a voter into the platform, uh, we, we're going to post this process and then it's uh, we, we're going to be done doing it a little bit down the road. Right now, we are tracking everybody's activity in, in, in the sense that all the participation, for example, we uh, participation in the community calls, uh, posting about our hackathon, bringing other hackers. So we're tracking this activity and we will be giving you a voting power based on that. Um, so thank you for, particip for participating today because your voting power will increase because you participated in this call. Um, yes. Uh, did I answer your question? Uh, yes. So, like, uh, I understand that every meeting call we are doing, it's like it will contribute to our voting power. It's like That's right. Increase. That's correct. That's correct. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Thank. Thank you for doing that. Um, yes. Thank you so much. Anyone else has a question or want to present? All right, so uh, if you have any questions, please ask us on Discord. I have a question. Yes, Daniel. So do we have an overview of like, first off, what allows us to aggregate voting power and second, what we're getting to vote on? I, Cause I, I'm not privy to kind of any of this information. Uh, yes, so all participation, for example, when you posting uh, about our hackathon in uh, somewhere, uh, on the social media. So mm -hmm. we have a tracking sheet. Uh, we also posted this tracking sheet in the in the Discord. Uh, if you cannot find it, uh, please ask a question and then we'll repost it. Uh, the, inf um, the good uh, channel to go to is useful links. You can go to useful links and then there we'll post all the links that are there. Uh, so the tracking sheet is uh, is there. We also, if you participate in the webinars, if you post on the social media about our event, if you bring participants, if you bring the sponsors, if you bring partners, so the, this kind of stuff is counts towards the voting power. So anything to do with this hackathon, and also the, uh, the our bot is counting the messages in Discord. So more more messages you uh, exchange messages, then more power also you get. Yes, and where can we know like our level of uh, our voting power? Uh, right now, we just oh, we we tracking it in the Google Sheets, uh, and then I will report this link in Discord in the useful links just right after this uh, call. I will do it, and the, please please go ahead and look into it. And if you have any discrepancy, let me know, and uh, we will. Uh, uh, Let's say that you participated in this call and you don't see it's updated in the sheet. You have to let us know. We will update it. So it's something like this, but we're trying to keep it up automatically, uh, tracking it in the in the sheet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you said can that the, oh. can the voting power be abused? So you say it again. Can it be abused? Can it be abused? The voting power. Uh, so we we doing it. Uh, so we finally will, will sign all our voters into the blockchain platform, where you actually have your Ethereum address attached, the one that attached to your email, the Ethereum address, so all these credentials. Uh, it's, uh, I mean, it could be abused if you create, I don't know, 100 emails or something like this, if you go for this. Uh, but it, again, if you did not participate as much in the uh, in the community, we will see that this is a fake email address, right? Yeah, so n n n I don't see the ways that it can be abused. I mean, you can always find, but uh, not likely. People who just joined and just register for the hackathon and don't do anything, no messages, no nothing on uh, on the Discord or anything like that. So we they have very little voting power. So therefore, fake accounts, for example, they will have a very little voting power, close to none. All right, any other questions? Very good questions, by the way. Thank you for them. 
Okay, no more questions. Thank you very much for everybody participating here. And uh, we will see you next time. Actually, our um, webinar is going to be held in Decentraland on May 17th. It's going to be this Sunday. It's going to be the same time. Uh, we posting the links on how to get there on Discord. Also, you can check out the tutorial on how to get on Decentraland, cryptochicks.ca slash SOS Hack Live. So all the recordings and all the tutorials are there. Uh, you can um, also join this event by Zoom as usual. So no worries if you don't, cannot get to this Decentraland. But it, I think it would be fun to get to, to Decentraland, which is a virtual reality built on blockchain, and explore it. So if you haven't done it, Please do. Thank you very much, and we will see you next time on uh, May 17th. Thank you. Thank you, Lena. That sounds very mm -hmm. exciting. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you very much. Bye.